altar here and have our communion with the Lord. But before we do that, please stand with me as we confess our sins to God and we receive our true and complete forgiveness and our absolution. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We will continue with the Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
to the prayers of your humble servants, and grant that what they ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now have our readings. reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Though then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please read Psalm 146. Six responsibly with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will sign to all generations. Praise the Lord. The epistle is from James chapter 2. Verses 1 through 10 and 14 through 18. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing well? But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Phoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go on your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decanopolis. And when they brought him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they began and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ear and after spitting, touched his tongue and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephephetha, which is be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all these things. He even makes the deaf hear, and the mute speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. This is a little different than normal. Take your hymnal out and turn to page 638. 638. We have a first communion, and we want to do this hymn, 638, but it's a little difficult, but I think the words are important. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to read the words down here where it says the choir, and then Judith is going to play the refrain. So we're going to sing the refrain, but then we're going to read the words. Does everybody have it? If you don't, it's okay. I've already messed up once in the service. So if you mess up, it's okay. All right, so we're going to start with the refrain, and then we're going to read number one. Then we're going to sing the refrain, and then we're going to read number two, and so on. Okay. Bread and drink this cup, 
you show his death until he comes. today, those in the future, but it's something that draws us each to the cross in which we can find our spiritual substance. In the gospel message today, we see a pretty unique message in a sense, at least that's how it's portrayed. Quite often you will find pastors or, or congregations or even theologians who find this troubling, but I am not one of those people. Quite often I hear, well, Jesus is being mean or rude to the woman, to which I will often refrain just Jesus is God and should he feel the need to be rude then he can I'm quite often rude to my son and I never ever ask for forgiveness and I get to do that but Jesus isn't being rude to the woman here if we don't understand fully the context of the story then we don't understand what's actually happening here Mark tries to lay it out for us but as we are 2,000 years departed from the second temple period there in Israel, it sometimes can become very difficult. Quite often, people think of the woman as if she is a Samaritan or one of the people in a society that's lesser than the Jews, but this is not the case, and Mark points that out. Mark tells us after she falls down at the feet of Jesus, he makes a special annotation to tell us, now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, Phoenician by birth. Now that's important because the Phoenicians were a very well-to-do people. So well, in fact, that they had survived from Alexander the Great, some of the very top of the Greek uh, imperialism, all the way through the Roman Empire, which they are still currently in. And the Phoenicians have done quite well. They're great in architecture, in art, in education. They're kind of the ancient Switzerland, in a sense. They just kind of do what everyone around them wants to do, will kind of appease the Germans and the English, whatever, we just want to remain the Phoenicians and see ourselves kind of bigger and better and more educated than those around them. So it makes a little bit more understanding when the Phoenician woman, this woman whom saw herself most likely as the Phoenician people did better than those little Jews from the South. And so when Jesus comes there and this Phoenician woman falls down at his feet, this is out of the ordinary. Now, it's no different than when Jesus is talking to the rich man. Remember, the rich man says, 
Rabbi, what should I do to, to go to heaven, to inherit the kingdom of God? And he says, go away and sell everything that you have, and then follow me. Now, Jesus didn't actually expect him to sell everything he had and follow him, but he was testing his heart. Where is your heart? If it's too difficult, in fact, to do that very thing, then maybe your heart isn't in the right place. Just as Jesus wasn't actually expecting the man to sell everything he had, Jesus was not actually expecting this woman to be treated and her children like dogs. But it is important to point out that to a woman in a society who saw themselves above and better than the Jews to fall down at the feet of Jesus, a woman who her custom was very flowing with gods, if it's the Greek gods today, that's fine. If it's the Babylonian gods tomorrow, we're okay with that. Well, we're back to the Romans and Zeus. That's fine with me. And Jesus makes sure to put a heart into the heart of this woman and say, you have to decide right now who is God. And she says, I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm willing to take a back seat, Lord, to you. Even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. There's enough crumbs falling off the table. God will even sustain me, even if it's through the crumbs. Now that is quite a wonderful understanding that the woman had. And it's an understanding that the Pharisees, just a couple sentences before, did not have. Remember, the Pharisees were challenging Jesus. Here the Pharisees legally have an obligation to be subordinate to a rabbi, and yet they refuse. And here is a woman who society says should be above the rabbi, and she falls down at her feet and says, that's fine, I'll be a dog. Surely there's enough crumbs from God that even I will be saved, and so too will my daughter. Quite often in our own lives, we start to engrandize ourselves. We see ourselves much more than we really should. And in fact, if anyone infringes on us, ourselves, we get upset and they become quite the enemy. I remember a few years ago there was a, a campaign, kind of a Christian national campaign of I am second. And I thought there was a really beautiful idea. It was short-lived, but I thought it was really quite nice. It's difficult in a society in which pretty much every song, realistically, every time we turn on the TV, in, in sports rooting, and I'm, I'm a part of that, we have to be number one. We have to be first. We have to be the best. We can't be anything other than that. And we see it as a failure if we are. And here's this woman saying, that's fine. I'll be second. There's plenty from God for me. It's a striking understanding of what we are, are about to do in communion. But in communion, it's a little bit different. See, in the end, Jesus tells her because of her statement, her child's healed, and he raises her to the top. And in communion, we too no longer become second, but we do become number one, not because of who we are, again, but because of whose we are. There's two things to remember in communion. Number one, it's our Christians, it's our Passover. Each time we do communion, we are celebrating our Passover. And in the Passover, they took the blood from the lamb and they put it over their door. And when they put the blood over the door, the angel of death passed through those areas. And he did what? When he saw the blood, he passed by. He didn't have to go inside and see if those people were worthy of being saved because it had nothing to do with what was on the inside of them. It had to do with the blood that was on the outside. And so too, when we get the blood of Christ, it has nothing to do with what's inside us or how many times we've failed or how many times we've messed up or how many times we have disappointed someone else, how many times we've let down our spouse or our families, or how many times we've messed up in life. And it doesn't even matter how many more times we're gonna do it in the future, because it has nothing to do with what's on the inside of us. It has everything to do with the blood that he gives to us. Jesus says that his blood is enough, that his death on the cross was enough to save you. Now, quite often people say, that's, you know, I, I don't need saving, I'm doing fine. Physically, I'm fine, but spiritually, it's a completely different thing. And I would be one to tell you that if you truly examined your heart and yourself in the mirror, you would see that spiritually, psychologically, you do need saving. Each of us does. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, as a licensed clinical counselor, I have lots of uh, times where I read and I'm trying to 
see some of the new techniques for helping people deal with some of the worst anxiety and depression, uh, dealing with some of the, the most crippling things that society has to throw at you. And quite often these new articles come out and they're, they're peer reviewed and they come out and they'll tell people, uh, well, they need to, to find something, a, a, a higher power, a greater being. They don't want to say God, but a, a higher being and they need to rely on him. Or say mantras. Say mantras as if I'm releasing this thing and I'm releasing this and I'm letting this go into the universe. And they say all these different things when in reality, none of it is different than what Jesus is trying to do for you at the cross. Jesus in communion, Jesus with the blood of Christ is trying to relieve you of that anxiety. He's trying to relieve you of that depression. He's trying to relieve you of the stress that I keep messing up in life. And no matter how hard I try, I kind of, I'm just going to continue to mess up again. That's okay. Because God knows you. God made you. God knows who you are. And I say this all the time, but it's very important and it, and it needs to be repeated that no matter what the world tries to tell you, you need to be. No matter what a magazine says is the perfect idea and look of a woman or, or what uh, the TV says you have to do or be or profession you have to have as a man, none of that truly matters as to who you are. Because no matter who the world tells you you should be, God made you exactly as you're supposed to be. And only in there do we find the freedom to be who we are, to be passionate about what we are passionate about, to enjoy our hobbies and what we like, and not have to be wrapped up in trying to be someone else. Because in the end, you're never gonna be perfect at someone else. You're only gonna be perfect at you and who God made you to be. So what does that mean? That means God wants us to be us. He knows that we're gonna continue to mess up and he says that's okay because his blood is enough to continually forgive us. Each time we come for forgiveness, we receive it. Now, this isn't just like a forgiveness that your teacher used to give you where she remembered so next time it was gonna be worse. Now this is absolute true forgiveness. It's gone, it no longer exists. It's important. Now remember, in communion we have a cup. Some of us are gonna use the common cup, some of us are gonna use the individual cup. It doesn't matter. Remember though, that even as far back as the days of Abraham, years and years ago, before we had a written contract, the way that they used to do a contract between two people, say there were two people that were, that were using the same land for their sheep, they would take a cup and they would pour wine in it. And one person would then take the cup and have a drink, and then the other person would take the cup and have a drink. And what they would do is make sure there was some of it still left in the cup at the end. And what that signified was, I'm never gonna take more than I need to, and you're never gonna take more than you need to, and together we're always gonna make sure each of us has enough. And it was a contract. And it's very fitting that Jesus does that very same thing with us. And he gives us the cup and he says, this is my blood. It's enough for you. No matter how much you mess up, no matter how much the demons come creeping into your head and tell you you're not good enough, no matter how many times you lose your job, no matter how many times you, you get abandoned, no matter how many times you let somebody down in your life, my blood is enough for you. He even goes further than that with the woman at the well and he says, my cup overfloweth. Not just there'll be some left. My cup overfloweth. He'll continue to say, to give me the weight. Take it off your own shoulders and let me carry it. There's so much within the blood and the body of Christ here in communion that's so important. Sometimes people tell me, well, I don't fully understand it. And I say, that's okay. There's a mystery within the Eucharist. There's a mystery within the Lord's Supper that we don't fully understand, and that's okay. We know this. It's supposed to feed our spiritual needs. It feeds us spiritually. It's spiritual food for us. I'll give you this analogy. You know, in the Old Testament, we saw the Israelites as they were, they were out in the desert for 40 years, and God sends them two things. You remember what that was? The first one was quail, but the second one was manna, right? This bread that fell from heaven, and they ate it. And quite often, I was always kind of, why? Why the manna? And it was always so important, why the manna? They could have easily lived off the quail. Physically, they could have lived off the quail. Why the manna? We still don't know quite why the manna. 
Why the manna? We don't fully understand it. What, what did that manna give them in nutrients or spiritual needs? We're not sure. But we do know this, that the manna from heaven has come down for us in the form of Christ and given to us in the Lord's Supper. And just as those people back then, after a couple of months and a couple of years, started to grumble and they said, enough with the manna. Why the manna? I'm tired of the manna. Sometimes we ourselves go, oh, it's a communion Sunday. That just adds another 10, 15 minutes of the service. Why the communion service? But each time we need to come back and receive it because it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual food. It's a coming before the cross. It's a kneeling down with Jesus and Jesus saying, here's my cup. There's going to be some for you. Not only is there going to be some for you, it's going to overflow it. My blood is enough for you. Will you mess up this week? Absolutely. But I'll forgive you again. My blood is enough for you. I didn't just die on the cross for everyone. I died on the cross for each and every one of you, individually and specifically. So when we take the bread and the wine today, remember that this is an individual thing with you. Jesus says, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. He goes on to say, I know everything about you to the number of hairs on your head. I know the worries and the anxieties. And he says to take heart when the world starts to crash down on you. I've overcome the world. And he says, even past that, I know your heavenly name and I know your heavenly body. I know you. I'm going to protect you. He says, I'm going to hold you in, your, in my hands and I'm going to deliver you to the Father. And when the world starts to come down on you and tell you that you're not enough, Jesus stands up and he says, you're exactly who you're supposed to be and you're more than enough. And not only that, my cup overfloweth. So as we come to the altar rail here in just a moment, remember to open your heart to the Lord. Don't try to hide anything from God. No one else will see it, but he will. Open your heart to the Lord. Give him the things that are weighing you down, your anxieties, the things that are hurting you, the things that you don't want those around you to see. Open your heart fully to him. Let him take those things from you and then give you the cup and say, my cup, son or daughter, overfloweth. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. May the peace that passes all understanding be in your heart and mind. Amen. Amen. Please turn to him 637, 637.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us made and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our prayers. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness, and we bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have given to us, and help us to show in our own lives a thankfulness and a life that is wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, establishing them the faith once delivered to the saints. Be with those today who are suffering much persecution in areas like Afghanistan and the far reaches of the Middle East and China for their faith in you. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceful life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially our President Joseph, Governor Gregg. Help them to understand that the decisions they make affect your children, and that they will be judged accordingly for their actions. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bless the schools and the churches and the colleges, universities, and centers of research and help them through this time of a pandemic with the virus. Be with our own little school here in McDade, who is trying to get through a school year dealing with the virus that they have had to deal with. Be with the children and the teachers. Be with all those who are seeking an education and to better themselves. Grant your wisdom in such a measure that the people may serve you honorably in both church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Sanctify your home, our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant, covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion, constantly helping them to perform all the sacraments needed to have a fruitful life with you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those whose death draws near and bring consolation to, any, to anyone in sorrow. We now pray for those who you, you have put on our hearts in silence. We pray for Emily, Forrest, Francis, Earl, Jericho, Dow, Bethany, Brad, Jacob, Stephanie, 
Cody and Kayla, Debbie, Scott, Tim, Loretta, Ray, Debbie, Leonard, Ryan, Harold, Gail, Brad, Cecilia, James, Kim, Trey Mart, Vivian, Hans, Jackson, Dana, Margaret, Roger, Ryder, Lacey, Craig. We pray a prayer of protection over Daniel, Kirk, Ray, and Anna, and all those serving in our national defense. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now share the peace, but we're going to share the peace in a social distant way. So if you could just turn to those around you, wave, and share the peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. <laughs> Becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and to drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful, with all the, faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom. 
which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship. With the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we are going to have a special First Communion today, so the immediate family of that will come up first. The ushers will help you through that. Uh, when you come up, you can kneel. Uh, as, as we welcome you, or you can stand, that's up to you. We offer both the common cup and the individual cup. If you don't want to take from the common cup, just take the individual cup as it comes by and hold that in your hand. If you do want the common cup, just let the individual cup go past. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
to the table of the Lord.
Welcome to the table of the Lord. God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
this communion, you came before the Lord and he showed you that his cup overflowed. Today you're going to leave and the world's going to be just as cruel and just as difficult, but take heart. His blood is enough for you. No matter how difficult it may seem, no matter how many times you may feel like it's time to give up on yourself, never ever do that because you're a child of God and he will never give up on you. Having said that, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. Now, before we do our last hymn, if we have any children who want to go get instruments to play this, play us out, please do that. Any kids that want to get an instrument, get an instrument. Play it as loud as you can so that they can hear us all the way at the other churches. Our departing hymn is going to be 924. 924. Thank <laughs> you.